Um, my my argument to that would be, well, were the promises made? Think about who the promise was made to. Was it made to a specific group of people, or was it made to an entity named as an like an like a nation? Like in other words, see, I look at the nation of Israel. I compare it. If I'm going to compare it, I'm going to use like like a corporation, for example. Like I'm in business, I have a corporation, but but it's very small and it's just me. But think about a corporation that has lots and lots of employees. If that corporation, and really corporation, the the, the reason it's called a corporation is it's, it's a body, but it's also a it's also a a non living entity. So, but and Israel is like that too. Without the people, there is no nation. So was the promise made to a nation as a corporation that has nothing to do with people because the people have to come through Christ anyway? Or was it made to a specific group of people that didn't exist when the promise was made? So that's why, that's why yeah, like, like if the promise is going to be fulfilled, is it fulfilled to the, the quote, nation of Israel but think about what is the nation of Israel. A nation is only a nation because it has people. Right. So what people were the promise in that case given to? The people who have long been dead now, they would have to come back to life. See, now if the nation dissolves, so like, and, and again, if you compare it to corporations, if, if the owner of a corporation says, I'm going to dissolve this corporation, but I want some of these employees to come over and, and follow me into the new corporation that I'm going to set up. My first corporation, it's now called Israel. You know, but my new corporation... Oh, my gee, new, okay, I think I know what you're doing with my this. My new corporation is going to be called the church. So, So... Is that what you think? Is that your position? That sounds like a dispensation. I'm just using it as an analogy, like, because now... Well, I don't believe now, there are two different, like, this, like separate, like, there's a new thing called the church now. Well, it's it's really like, I mean, it's the ecclesia, it's the body of Christ. It's a, it's I believe a, it's always uh, been the same from, from, from the beginning. It's always been a collective body of Jew and Gentile. Right, but you have the change of old from old covenant to new covenant, and the, it, it talks yeah, about a better covenant yeah. built on a better promise. So why do you still need the old promise to a certain group of people? Makes it, well, I'm it, talking about the covenant of Abraham that was going to bless all nations, and that includes Israel. Right. Oh, yeah, oh. That's, not, that's not the old covenant. That's the covenant of grace. That's the covenant of promise. Well, I don't call Abraham a covenant the old covenant. I call a Mosaic covenant the old covenant. Abraham right. covenant. That's what I'm talking about. The 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 Mosaic. I believe the Mosaic covenant was just a works based land covenant that was made with ethnic Israel. So I, I'm not talking about that. That's not what the promise was. The promise. I'm talking about the Abrahamic covenant. That's so the promise. when Paul talks about the promise that God made to the fathers in Romans 11, the father, the, the patriarchs he's referring to there are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the promise that he's referring back. He's not talking about the Sinai covenant. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So what was what do you say the promise was? That in Abraham's seed, all the nations, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Right. Yeah. Which and is what's ultimately fulfilled in Christ. So what does that have to do with a nation of, of an ethnic nation of Israel then? Well, I would say they received their blessing because that's where the seed come. But I don't see any difference in someone coming to Christ in Israel versus someone coming to Christ in Arkansas. Right. Like in the land of Israel? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. In other, in other words, there is no difference. I'm not really talking about geographic location. So you're not talking, okay, so you're, um, are you talking well, about like the race of Jews? Yeah, I think Paul in Romans, <coughs> he talked about the promise God made to the fathers. It's fulfilled ultimately in Christ, right? But Israel is included within that, partly because of the fact that the Abrahamic covenant says that all nations are going to be blessed in Christ. 
Right, Paul, but are they are they included Paul, differently than any other nation? Well, no. I, I said that they have to come in. They have to come in through through Christ, just like they have to be saved the same way everyone else is. And, and that's why I don't. I don't think you know. Well, what's there's special? Like, I'm not. Mi I'm missing something. What's special about Israel then? Um, you know what I mean? Like, if they're going to come in the same way as as any other nation. Then why even give them? Well, why would they have to come in? Why would they have to come in a different way in order for? They wouldn't. Uh, God making a specific promise to ethnic Israel be like. Well, they, well, I don't, no, I don't I didn't say they would. But, well, no, it sounds like that's what your argument's based off of. <laughs> like, because you're saying, uh, you're saying, if, if they have to be converted, if they have to put faith in Christ, just like everyone else does, mm -hmm. right? What's special about Israel? Right. Right. Yeah, and I don't see the connection there. I don't see why they like. Why would they have to be saved differently, in order for that to be the case? No, we're. we're, we're I think I, you guys are arguing the same thing, aren't you? I we're think you. Yeah, it sounds to me like you guys are arguing the same thing. Yeah, either we're arguing the same thing or miscommunicating. But, but yeah. Tyler, you're saying that that God has something in store for Israel because of the promise. But that sounds like that implies that it's something special for Israel. Right. Well, in a sense, because I mean, like I, I mean, Stacy alluded to how they did receive a, a blessing in a sense that, in the sense that Christ, you know, was born to them. Right? Christ was an Israelite according to the flesh. Um, I don't know. I guess in my mind, maybe, maybe there's like a difference in how we're like connecting all of it. Because to me, I, I feel like I feel like I would take what Stacy said and I would just extend that further. And I would say that one of the, the ways in which they're going to be blessed through Christ is that they're going to be converted again when the veil is lifted off of them. Like Paul talks about, like I said, I, I know I keep going back to that same passage, but I think that's like a key passage in it, you know? So that's why I keep Which passage? In Romans, well, really Romans like nine through 11, the whole thing, but, right. but Romans 11 specifically. Paul talks about um, Whenever, how most no of his fellow Jews right. are not coming to the gospel. Yeah. And he says that their restoration will be as life from the dead for the rest of the, the nations. You know, so. Yeah. And you don't think that's happened? Um, I do think it's partly happened. I, I've been, you know, I, I was really skeptical uh, for a really long time about like the relevance that the uh, modern state of Israel has, like in terms of uh, eschatology and that kind of relevance. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do think there's some, there's some relevance to it. I, I, I wouldn't consider myself like a, and this is why I, I try to make sure I make this clear when I'm like debating this here. I use a little bit more nuance. Like I'm not, I, you know, I don't consider myself like a hardcore Zionist or something like that, but I, I'd say I hold more of a moderate view. Um, I do think it's significant. Just I don't know. I don't. I don't make a huge, you know, issue. So let me let me just. Okay, oh, right. so you you would like to expound a little bit more on what I had said, where they did receive the blessing, and that was the seed of Abraham, which was Christ. So what I would like to ask you is, if Israel is to be blessed because of the promise, uh, which is different than the nations then what would that blessing look like? What would that blessing be? The blessing is going to be when, when they recognize their Messiah as a, as a nation and they, they're converted. Who's they? Israel. I'm talking about the, the ethnic nation of Israel. Paul's brother and Paul's kinsmen, according to the flesh. They're Romans. <clears throat> I see. So really, um, it's, it's no different than someone coming to Christ who is a Gentile, uh, they just come to Christ. But you're saying that when a Jew comes to Christ, they will recognize that he will, is their Jewish Messiah. And for them, that will be a blessing. But there's no really external significance or showing of that. It's just more like an internal perception. Well, and Paul also seems to suggest that it's going to have some kind of positive influence on the rest of the world as well, depending on how you read that section there in Romans 11. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because in, in that 
that section, Paul even we, we see this is the thing like you know because this is part of the area where Matthew and I disagree on this section I think is um because we both agree you know to an extent about obviously you know there's no difference essentially between like the church quote unquote right the ecclesia and Israel and stuff but in Romans 11 it's interesting because Paul makes like a specific you know distinction where he even quotes a passage or he paraphrases a passage from Isaiah, where you know he says that there shall come a there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And in the context there, he's talking about ethnic Israel, like he's still applying that to his his kinsmen. That that's the the entire subject of his discourse, you know, from chapter nine to chapter right. ten to chapter eleven. It's, it's you know, so there's still some kind of nuance there. And right. that's why, for me, I'm not fully convinced, you know, of this idea that, like, there's no relevance whatsoever, you know. Yeah, there's, a, there's another way to read uh, Romans, not just 9 through 11, but 1 through 11. There's another way to read it. And, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> 1 through 11, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. really, it's really, the, I mean, he's, he's doing one thing in Romans 1 through 11. It's trying to show that Israel has no more relevance. And it's <laughs> like the complete opposite of what I'm saying. It's a, I, yeah. Oh, I, I know that. And, uh, and I know uh, that sounds, I know at first that sounds very crazy, but if you keep, you know. Why well, know? I mean, we've talked about it before. So. Right. I mean, but when he says in Romans 11, so <laughs> in, uh, and so all Israel will be saved. The word and so is really in this manner. So after all his treaties on how Israel really doesn't have any advantages, how, you know, circumcision doesn't really mean anything, how the oracles really just condemned Israel, how, you know, J with Jacob and Esau, it's always the second son who gets the blessing, not the firstborn, you know, just like uh, Galatians where, you know, the one who represents Mount Sinai and and her mother is kicked out never to receive the promise or, or the inheritance his whole point is that though he wants his kinsmen saved he's lamenting because they're just not getting saved he's trying to save quote some of them but then he goes and then he talks about christ and uh you know you know like in romans in romans 8 where he talks about there's now no condemnation for those who are in christ by the time he gets to 11, it's like, and so all Israel will be saved. In other words, in this manner is all, quote, Israel. But in Romans 9, 6, there's two Israels. Not all is Israel. Uh -huh. So if you follow his argument, if not all Israel, if not all who is from Israel is Israel, he, he right there defines a new kind of Israel. Because not Wait, all. Where did he do that? What's that? Oh, you're talking about back in chapter nine when he says not all Israel are of Israel. Right, right there. There's two oh, Israels. Yeah. He's defining yeah. a brand new kind of Israel. But then by the time he gets to Romans 11, he says, "And in this manner, all Israel will be saved." In other words, don't think the promises of God have. This is the whole point. Don't think the promises have failed, because the promise really wasn't what you thought it was going to be. The promise was a mystery that now Jew and Gentile are one. That's what he says in Ephesians. He's just, he's just reiterating what he's written before in Ephesians. In Ephesians 8, in, uh, I mean, Ephesians 3 and 8 are pretty parallel. Yeah. So I, I know think, you're not, you probably don't have the passage in front of you, and that's probably why it sounds like you're paraphrasing a lot, but a lot of that just sounds like a lot of paraphrasing of Romans 11. Well, sure. No, I don't have the para. I don't have the the yeah. passage. But because I mean, there's some like really specific. I mean, we both. I mean, yeah. The, the point in Romans nine, you know, if you're not of faith, ultimately, if you don't have faith in the promise, you're not counted for the seed. Like Paul makes that very clear. But there's just some real. I don't know. I just think there's some really specific like statements he makes that we'd have to go over. I guess so. But. Well, Paul is a tricky, 
He's a oh, yeah, tricky guy. That's why we've discussed the same passage like five times and haven't agreed, <laughs> agreed with each other. No, it's so, still good. No, it's Peter. still good because Lori wants to listen in. Right. Right. No, yeah, yeah. Peter does say Paul is hard to understand. Yeah. There's a reason he's hard to understand. You can't take what he says at face value all the time. But what would, Tyler, I'm curious then, what would you make of Romans 9, 6? What exactly is Paul saying when he, when he uses Israel in two different ways in the same verse? Yeah, I think his, his point there is uh, what I mentioned before, that uh, uh, you're not, th those who are of faith, are, are counted as the seed, just like he talks about in Galatians. So that, that's the thing ultimately that is going to justify you before God and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, merit your salvation. Well, I don't want to say merit, but you know, you know right, what I mean? Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I don't think, you know, I, I think the key, like we would both agree, obviously, is taking this in conjunction with the entire context. So it's a continuous thought, obviously, from 9 through 11. I mean, obviously, even, even into chapter 8. But we would be reading both, you know, both of those sections very differently. Um, but what I see Paul getting at in the space of, you know, Romans 9 through 11 is he's, he just got done talking about, uh, you know, how... Christ has died for us in, in, in the end of chapter 8, and we can have this great confidence in Christ, and no one can separate us from the love of God, and all sorts of stuff. And then he says, he goes into chapter 9 about this other discussion about why his own people, his own kinsmen, are not being saved, why they're not, the majority of them are not accepting the gospel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, I mean, Romans 9 is like a whole other debate we can get into, obviously, but um, when he explains what God is doing, um, I would say, I guess you could use the word providentially. Um, he's saying that this is all working towards the inclusion of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of chapter nine, he starts more specifically honing in on Israel's unbelief. Right. And it's very clear throughout the context yes, he makes that statement in verse six that not all Israel of Israel, I mean, not, not all individual israelites are of i was gonna uh, i would say of god's elect they're not they're not you know especially beloved of god they're not they're not uh going to be saved in a nutshell but towards the end he's specifically talking in no uncertain terms about his kinsmen and the gentiles and just like he mentioned at the very beginning i could wish that i were uh, a curse for my kinsmen, right? My, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Um, you know, and, and that's his continuous train of thought all the way up to chapter 11. Mm -hmm. You know, so far, uh, where, with everything he said. Yeah. So I, mean, I guess the, that's why I said that I, I think the main uh, section would probably have to be because in chapter 10, I kind of see him more focusing on. The fact that, you know, he's talking about how, you know, how are the Gentiles going to believe in a God they've never heard of? And that's why they need a preacher and that kind of a thing. Um, right. And then he says, but yeah, so th that's why I said that I think chapter 11 is like the, the main part there. Because he talks about how during his own time, there was already a remnant, according to Grace. There was a remnant of, of his, again, his kinsmen as actual ethnic Israelites. Um, and then when you get down to chapter 11, he's, you know, and, and actually... Where's that other place? Um, oh, yeah, in verse 1. Th this is super important. See, and, and this is what I'm trying to do. Like, I, I, I'm really just trying to make sure that I'm not, you know, overlooking some of the nuances here of what Paul's talking about. You know, because you and I, can, like, we agree on a lot of the stuff, but it's like a good example of what I'm talking about is here in verse 1. You know, we agree the true people of God, right? Who are the, the true people of God, right? The people that are accounted for the seed. Like he says in chapter 9, not all Israel is a... Not all Israel is of Israel, right? It's, it's those who have faith in Christ. But then look at what he says in, in, in Romans 11, though. He says, hath God cast away his people? Okay, well, wait a minute. There's, there's something going on there, right? Where it's like, we know who the people of God are in a true sense, right? In, in, in a saving, salvific well, sense. It's those who have faith in Christ. 
But then right. Paul turns around and he's using this language. Likewise, we know who Jacob truly is. We know who Israel truly is, right? But then when we when we read further on down in Romans 11, he quotes a passage talking about uh, the, the, the Savior coming from Zion and, and, and delivering Jacob from his sins, and he's explicitly applying it to his fellow ethnic Israelites, the actual ethnic nation of Israel. So I just think that there's more going on there than just it's all spiritual, it's all you know that kind of a thing. Well, <laughs> and like, well there is there there is a, another way that you could read Romans eleven one. Absolutely, and that would be that you know because the Gentiles were coming into to belief that oh well God doesn't have anything to do with Israel, so Israel proper cannot be saved now because you know the law is being done away and there's a new covenant so they're completely outcast and so when he's saying this he's like by no means because he's also referring to himself right, being yeah. a descendant of abraham and that he was able to come into the faith so likewise israelites can also come into the faith just like the gentiles are doing let me uh i want to add really to that, that i don't really disagree i think that's yeah that's his yeah, I would agree that that's his point, but he's he's still saying he's still using this kind of language, like I said, of you know, has God cast away his people, right? Yeah, like what? Yeah, but he's not talk. Let me let me chime in on this a little bit. He's not talking about his people as a whole. His whole point is that had there not been a small remnant, they would have been like Sodom. They would have been like Gomorrah. What's his point? His point is that no one can now say that God cast away his people. Why? Because he saved a small remnant from them. Yeah, but who does his people refer to? Israel. Ethnic Israel, right? Correct. Right, but a remnant. It's always been a remnant, even when you look at the Old Testament, whereas you've got all these... Um, oh, yeah, that's what his whole point is. I think it says, I will be their God and they will be my people, but it's only the remnant that he's discussing. Right. And Paul gets a little, he starts to get even a little tricky in Romans chapter two. Who does he call a Jew in quotes? The church. He says the Jew is not one who's circumcised outwardly. No, no, that's not the Jew. He says right. the Jew is one who's circumcised inwardly. He just called everyone who believes in Christ a Jew. But and that's see, Colossians that's chapter that's two. That's, that's, that's right, Romans yeah. two. Uh, it's well, also it's Colossians God. chapter two. Oh, so okay. Circumcised without hands. Right, but right, see, right, right. I think that that points, uh, Matthew, to what I'm getting at, which is this kind of duality in the language that Paul's using throughout the book of Romans. I think that that's all that that's really showing. Like, I, I don't disagree with what you just said about Romans 11. 1. It's obvious in the context he's talking. He does talk about the remnant. That's why he talks about Elijah and how, you know, uh, God had reserved a certain number who had not bowed the knee to Baal and all that, you know, so I, I don't have any problem with that, but I don't think that that really, uh, I don't know, I agree with that, is what I'm saying, like, I don't see that as contrary to my point that there's like this kind of, there's two different ways that he's sort of speaking, though, throughout the letter, especially in this section, chapter 11. So there's still something special for the nation, but can you, I don't know if you defined, Stacy asked you earlier, I don't know if you defined what that is, though, yet. Have you? What What is... I'm still developing... My, I'm totally open about the fact that I, I can't articulate all of this perfectly yet. Um, all I know is that when I read this section, it's really difficult for me to come away not thinking that Paul is describing some kind of a future national blessing for ethnic Israel. Um, I, you know, and, and he's basing it, like I said, in some way, however, I end up articulating that in the end, because like I said, I, you know, I'm probably not doing a very good job of articulating it. I got to tell but, you, I, for somebody, I know you're not a dispensationalist, and that's what blows me away. I have never heard anyone who is not a dispensationalist think that something is there for Israel in the future. It just I think that's so mind. weird, because that's like, you're like, just ignoring like, five six hundred years of protestant theology and even before like the protestant reformation like it's, that's incredibly weird to me that you think that no, that that's like only just something that dispensationalists kind of came up with out of thin air one day but if that, it's like, so if it's if it's so weird then how come you can't articulate what the promise is 
because I need to study more and, and focus on defending my position on this more. Because I haven't think, been focusing on it as much. Isn't as there before. isn't there one Lord, one faith, one baptism? Aren't Jew and Gentile in one body, it says in Ephesians, one body, co heirs of the same promise? Well, I, I feel for you, Tyler. Uh I I have the same uh, desire that all ethnic Israel be saved, but yet, you know, I'm a hopeful universalist anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, and like I said, too, it, it, it kind of, I mean, I, I base it more so also on, on my post-millennial leanings as well, so, I mean, and, and for the record, Matthew, I don't see anything you just said as being, like I said, um, contradictory to what i'm talking about because i'm not saying that anyone is saved any other different any other kind of way or oh, no like i understand that. no i i get that it, it's really hard to refute you know jew and gentile being co-heirs because that's literally what it says so it's that's you know well like, why do you i don't get it though why are you like using that as an argument because if because if israel has something special then they have a separate promise. There's almost two new covenants, one for the, the, the corporate body and then one little separate new covenant for no, ethnic I, I think of it more in terms of Israel were the ones to whom these promises were initially made and given, which Paul says in Romans 9. They're the ones from whom the Messiah himself came. Mm -hmm. And Paul is simply saying that in the future, they're going to recognize their Messiah they're, they're, that when the fullness of the Gentiles come again. And uh, I mean, that, I don't know if that's maybe too basic of a view or something, but that's kind of what I'm seeing right now anyway in Romans. Have you considered uh, possibly audience relevance that when, when the time that he was talking, that it was the plight of, of Israel at that time, but then in 70 AD, Israel basically ceased to become a nation until, you know, almost 2000 years later? Well, I think that has some relevance, too, because that goes into what Jesus was talking about, about the times of the, the Gentiles and all that. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't really connect that specifically to Romans 11. I know some people try to say that, you know, the fullness of the Gentiles is the same thing as the times of the Gentiles. I don't really, I'm not really convinced of that, if that's what you're talking about. I think fullness of the of the Gentiles or, or fullness of the nations might have more to do with, and, and there's been different debates on, you know, what exactly that refers to. Too. Like some people said, like, oh, when all the Gentiles get saved, they're supposed to get saved or something like that. I don't really think that's what it's talking about either. Right, and I can um, see that. So, so let me. Let I think me... it has more to do when the time comes when uh, the gospel has leavened the nations as a whole. Then we're going to see this thing happen with. With, it, with Israel, Israel is going to follow that, and it's going to be a blessing. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you a little bit more about this blessing idea. Uh, would you um, think or consider that you know all of the nation, all of the wealth of the nations would pour into Israel? That that would be one way of it being blessed. Uh, I don't know. I, I tend to I tend to think of it more as being like. A, spiritually or you know in an edifying sense i don't really know if it has to do with material prosperity or something like that <laughs> okay it has to do you know and i admit it's a tricky like we said it's a tricky passage but you know when when he talks about how the casting away of them is the reconciling of the world which i interpret of the nations what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead so he, he says that Israel's being received again will be his life from the dead. And, and that's, again, interesting because Paul is, has already talked about how there's a remnant during his time, right? There's a remnant, according to the election of grace, that's getting saved. So that's not what he's talking about there when he says the receiving of them. And then he talks about, um, where's that other section? But and, the receiving of them doesn't have to be corporate. It could be individual. Because I see he's only talking about that earlier on when he talks about individual Israelites being saved, right? Like he said to himself, like, I'm also an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin. So he already talked about the, the remnant of grace that was already being, you know, uh, right. preserved in, in faith. 
And that's so, actually his rhetorical answer to his own question. Has God cast away his people? No, look at me. I'm saying exactly. Yeah. So, so, the, so the, the proof, people, the proof that the, the proof that the nation isn't cast away is not they'll eventually get saved as a nation. It's, I'm saved, I'm from Benjamin. Yeah, I don't think, it would be kind of weird if he was saying that that's going to be the proof because that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen for a really long time. But I think that what I'm saying is when you get down to verse 15, and he talks about them being cast away. Well, okay, the remnant hasn't been cast away. So it's not talking about them. And then he talks about them being received again. The remnant was already being received. There, were, there was already a remnant, according to the election of grace, that was saved during Paul's own time. So he's not talking about them either in verse 15. So I don't see any other option there than to say that he's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about a corporate uh, do, you, do you see a significance in the fact that God calls Israel my, my firstborn son? And then when Jesus gets baptized, the voice says, my one and only son. Um, what verse does he call him his one and only son? Just one. Oh. Or like, is, is that the? Are you making any? Are you making some kind of significant point off of that? Or well, it's, if not, you know, it's it's yeah. not that it's not that this is the proof. It's just that you know, take take for example, um, like when when Ishmael uh, when God. Let, when God wants to test I, mean, I agree Christ is a type of, or Israel is a type of, of Christ. Christ is ideal Israel, like we've talked about before. <laughs> well, hold on, hold on, because I was making a point there before you chimed in. It, I'm sorry. When, when, God, when God tells Abraham, right, to, to take Isaac up to the mount, Abraham's got a son who's about 13 years old. But God really? tells Abraham to take your only son. That's the son of promise. That's what Paul is talking about in Romans 9. The son of promise, Isaac, was a foreshadow of Christ. He's the one who carried his own wood up to the mountain. Yeah. And, he's the, and Abraham represents the father, Abba, Abraham. The whole thing is a picture. And what is Ishmael a picture of? It's the firstborn son, right, who gets, who gets kicked out out because it's of works you don't exactly. see you don't see the whole significance yeah i don't we yeah no i mean we've talked about that before I, that's what paul talks about in galatians right where he gives the analogy but this is why i think paul is so so hard to understand because paul is taking his vast knowledge of all of this jewish history and he's putting it into a treatise and and that's what i think he's doing he's taking you know uh even esau Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Why does he say that? He didn't hate Esau. Because <laughs> Esau is the firstborn son, representative of Israel, who sells his birthright, who despises his birthright. It's a picture of Israel, once again. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry. Maybe you have to, like, explain the relevance to what we're talking about. You don't see the relevance in that. That, so sorry. So if if, if Israel, I'm not being snarky. I just yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a little lost. All right, all right. No, no, no. I don't. I don't think you're being snarky. But I'm just. I'm just surprised that you know you don't see it because I. Well, I'm you sitting, see about like for the most part about the types and shadows and and, and Israel's a type of Christ and I know what you're talking about about the firstborn right. and the blessing and all sort of stuff. Yeah, I get that. But that's what Paul acknowledges that in the passage in question where he says the blindness in part has happened to Israel, Romans 9 through 11, he's lamenting over this fact that Israel has been uh, blinded largely. Right. Right. Yeah. So I don't, so that's what I see you basically describing, but that's, yeah, that's already in Romans 9 through 11. Like we already agree on that. What do you think Paul means when he, when he compares uh, Hagar and Sarah to, you know, to the bond woman and the free woman. And he says, cast out the bond woman. For for her, her her and her son will never inherit the promise. What is he talking about? He's talking about those who are trusting in works, and in the uh, the Sinai covenant for justification. Right. Okay. Well, those who trust in works will not ever inherit 
the promises. That's why they need to be converted and, and trust in uh, the work of Christ. All right. So that, I mean, I, that's consistent in what, what you're saying, because I know yeah. that, that you're saying those in Israel who do have faith, well, that's, those are the recipients of the promise, but they have to have faith in Christ. Yeah. I think that they've received, the, it's like what Paul says, that the, 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 the promise blesses all nations. It was initially given to Israel. And I just think his point there is that Israel as a nation is going to see the fulfillment of those, those promises and it's going to affect them as well on, an, on, a, on a larger scale. Because you got to keep in mind, again, I believe the gospel is actually going to leaven all nations. So that includes Israel, uh, the people to whom it was initially given, who were temporarily cast aside and blinded for their rejection of the, the, the Messiah. Um, they're going to see the fulfillment of that just like everyone else is. Mm -hmm. So that's the sense in which I see it connected to the promise that these things were initially made to them. And as Paul talks about, they've been partially blinded, but when they are received again, it's going to be his life from the dead. And that's another really interesting phrase, by the way, it, Israel, it, when they're received again, it's going to be like life from the dead. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty powerful analogy. Well, wait, wait, because if we go to Colossians, uh, let me go there real quick. Because in uh, chapter 1, verse 22, I mean, he's talking to Colossae, right? And he says, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless. Uh, let me see. Uh, right. When you were dead in your trespasses, it, it says that. Um, hold on, let me see where it is. Maybe it's chapter two. Yeah, probably chapter two, okay. Are you talking about, oh no, never mind. I was thinking of Ephesians. All right, it's in chapter two, it's verse 13. Okay. So this is this is not to Jews. This is to Colossae, right? And it's the same type thing. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. It's coming back from the dead. It's no, yeah. it's no different than the way he was saying that these the Jews will come back from the dead, just like you, Colossae, has come back from the dead. Yeah, okay. Well, you're talking about, so like in a salvific sense? Well, that makes, I mean, that, that explanation makes sense if what I'm talking about is accurate, that we're talking about a natural conversion. Although it is significant that... Um, in in scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, the uh, reviving kind of language is also used nationally, like in the book of Ezra and the Psalms and elsewhere where it talks about God reviving us again and that kind of a thing. But I think either way that, that would that would fit nicely with what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> Tyler, there's a uh, when you you mentioned the promises, right? So that reminds me of a verse in Acts. This verse I think is extremely, extremely significant. It says in Acts 13, 31, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again. Then he goes on to talk about David. And the reason he's going to talk about David is because he's trying to explain to the Jews, you're expecting David to come back to life and some restoration of Israel. He, he's saying, no, 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 no. David is decayed. But I'm talking about the one who didn't see decay. Christ is the one who fulfills the promise. The promises are fulfilled in that Christ was raised from the dead. Not that the nation of Israel gets saved, the promise, in other words, was something you guys didn't expect. Of course, the promises were given to them uh, 
But like you said, it's not even about the land. It's about that Abraham would be the father of many nations. But, what, but if Christ is raised from the dead and then, and then Gentiles start getting saved and a remnant of Israel, all of a sudden, the promise of Abraham is thus fulfilled. So, um, well, it's interesting that in that passage you just quoted, he still connects it to us and our children. And that's the same thing Peter does in Acts chapter 2 when he's preaching to Jews. And he says, the promise is unto you and to your children, etc. And then he also links that to Gentiles. And all who are far off, right. Right. Um, I don't want to lose my train of thought because you said a, little, uh, a bit there that I wanted to respond to. Um, dang it. Yeah, that's all right. Take your time. Um, oh, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. So this goes to my point, right? There is a sense in which you could say the promise was fulfilled, right? But it's just like talking about any other promise or any other covenant in Scripture, right? I mean, you and I, like, aren't full preterists, for example, right? We wouldn't say that, like, everything has been fulfilled yet. Mm -hmm. So God fulfilled the promise in some sense, yes, by raising Christ from the dead, obviously. I would even specifically connect that to the Davidic covenant, right? Because he has been seated on the throne of David. But uh, that doesn't mean that it's it's come to fruition yet in, in you know, in terms of... Uh, Agree. Uh, yeah, you get what I'm saying. So, yeah. I mean, I still would think that that, I mean, I don't think that that's uh, incompatible with what I'm, I'm getting at either. Um, and, and I apologize, by the way, if I'm being, if I haven't made it clear what I'm saying. Oh, no, no, I, no, I no, 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 please. No, there's definitely no reason to apologize. I'm just trying to like, um, I, I still want to know what the promise looks like then. It's, it's like, I don't get it. I really don't get this view at all. I know you say it's historical. It's been around for a long time. But I don't know how you can say that the promises are fulfilled in Christ. Uh, the nations are getting saved, and thus the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled. And yet, God has something specific just for the nation of Israel, whose genealogical records just happen to be destroyed at 78. See, I'm kind see, of in the dark with that, too. Yeah, see, I'm not, I'm not thinking of it in terms of like, oh, this one specific thing I, I think of it like i already said that that israel were the ones to whom these things were initially delivered granted they rejected the messiah they were blinded the promise goes to the or the, the blessing goes to the, the gentiles or the nations right but see i don't believe that that part of it has even been fulfilled for the gentiles yet because i, I believe that that's going to be completely fulfilled mm -hmm. um or at least more fulfilled i guess technically not everything is fulfilled until the second coming but um, when the nations as a whole uh, are actually uh, re repenting and covenanting with the God of Israel again. And at that time, that is when uh, the ethnic nation of Israel are going to see those uh, promises that were initially given to them. They're going to see them fulfilled on a large scale, and it's going to be fulfilled in them also, along so with all the other nations. So you say covenanting with Israel again. Is that the new covenant? With the God, or is with that God, the, new, with the God of Israel. Like Isaiah chapter 2 says, where it's, it talks about uh, the nations uh, you know, beating their swords into plowshares and saying, let us you know, go up to the house of the Lord. And you know, you know the prophecy I'm talking about. Right, but is that a new covenant? Or is that a new, new covenant? Or a new special Israel covenant? Like uh, well, covenanting in this, in this um, that's just a reformed term, um, what I mean by that is just they're they're agreeing uh, to worship the God of Israel. What covenant is it part of? Well, they're under the new covenant if they're Christians. <laughs> I would I would think that Tyler would answer that by saying that they are in the nucleus of the new covenant, and the Gentiles and every in the church or ecclesia is you know in the periphery or of that and still covered by the new covenant. Yeah, when I say covenant, I'm just using covenanting as a verb. It just means you're yeah, agreeing yeah, with yeah, each other right. to you know, do something. Yeah. You, you have, you you have headway as, it's, it's an aspect, you know, and I'm, I believe me, I'm not calling you a dispensationalist because I know you're not, but it, it's an yeah. aspect of dispensationalism. Uh or, or it's 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 a shared view. Let's put it that way. It's just really anachronistic. 
though, to like to call it dispensationalist. No, no, no. I'm not calling it that. It's it's a shared. It's it's a little shared aspect of it. Sure, but if that if that's the case, I mean, all that is just dispensationalists just took something that was already around and they just built like a bunch of weirdness around it, a bunch of weird theology around it. That's possible. Yeah. Well, I, I see the point there. I mean, because because like I said to you, this is directly connected with you know. Um, a broader eschatological framework that this is the reason why sorry my dog's outside of my door making a bunch of noise <laughs> he's like digging through the trash or something um th this is part of like a, a much broader sort of eschatological framework where it's like you know it, it's not you know when when the puritans were out you know and, and during like the second reformation when there was like all this evangelistic hype and stuff like that you know they weren't just about like, oh yeah, we gotta you know focus on the Jews or something, right? But they they, they were thinking, man, the gospel is, is spreading so far and wide right now, and 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 Christ is is King, and and he's you know winning his enemies to the gospel, and and man, you know, uh, we, we should expect the the Jews and, and the Muslims to be converted soon too, you know, <laughs> like right, that right. kind of an, it wasn't just this thing of like. You know now, but see again, they, they connected it, like I said, to stuff that Paul says, um, and granted, even some Old Testament prophecies and stuff like that. They they did connect to some of those things, you know. But it, it's not, it's just not, it's just fundamentally different from the way that a lot of uh, you know dispensationalists try to connect everything. Oh no, no, I I, I hear you. Let me ask you this, uh, because you you say that you know, like Stacy and I have asked you, like, well, what does this promise? literally look like when it takes place and you say well i have to study it out Where well i would say it's the nation's being blessed but i think that that hasn't come to fruition completely it has right right but, right but my question to that is if if you really got the desire to say to to to, to figure out like what what the answer to that question is and you and you wanted to search it out where would you look like, where would you, what scriptures do you think you'd have to go to to find out what the, the actual, like, um, current series of events will be? I would, that is an excellent I would, question, Matthew. I, I think there's a couple of places in scripture to go. I would go, number one, to the initial place where the promises were made back in Genesis. Other references in the Old Testament that possibly reference that. And then, obviously, I would also look at how the apostles understood the promises and what they said about their fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. It's very, very interesting. <laughs> that God would like focus on an ethnicity. We well, you know when James, James does quote an Amos restoration passage. Mm, right. That's, that's true. About the, the tabernacle of David. There mm -hmm. are so many. It says in Amos, the end of my people, as Israel has has come up. You know, like God had a plan to to. Uh, I, from what I can tell, in the in the, God had a plan to end this nation. This is, this is the old. You know, the, yeah. the, the old order of things. It's not one nation anymore. It's it's you know it's nations. God's no respect. Of yeah, it's all the nations, all nations being blessed in the seed. Right. Like yeah. evenly and equally, like not, well, then one, like yeah. I, don't even, I don't even get like, so what does he do? Is he search out the DNA? Because of course he's God. If he, he can, <laughs> he can, he can go to the Samaritan and say, okay, I know how much Jew blood you have in you. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny either. Like I'm just no, trying to. But now we're getting into like another can of worms about. <laughs> The Jews being the Jews and Khazar theory and all that crap. Oh, I don't. I wasn't even thinking of that. I'm. I'm just. Oh, okay. I'm just trying I'm to like. Trying. I'm trying to imagine like believing that God will, will would have something to do with ethnic Israel, and I'm thinking like, like Laurie said before, like, what's the point? Like, why? What's ethnicity got to do with anything? Yeah. So let me ask you this, uh, because I I do understand that uh, you hold. <sighs> Uh, the the importance of grace, okay? So would grace be any different to an ethnic Jew versus a, a Gentile? Or would oh, that grace look definitely. the same or what? 
I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but no, I would say no. Do they have any apportioned special, you know, grace given? I think I've explained. I guess the from way I'm reformed, looking at it, Romans, yeah, like sort of straightforwardly. I think that the whole point Paul makes is, uh, well, I don't know. Should I, should I repeat myself again? Or? It wouldn't be a hard question to answer for somebody reformed as yourself, because if God is apportioning grace, you know. Yeah, to, I did answer it. I said no. Right. Yeah. Then, then yeah, he could apportion more grace to, to ethnic Israel if that's, you know, to fulfill promises. Go ahead and repeat yourself, Tyler. We do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the point Paul's driving at in Romans 9 through 11 is ethnic Israel are the ones to whom these promises were initially made. The covenants, the promise of the, the, the coming Messiah, right? They're the ones to whom the promise was initially made, and all these things were initially given. They were blinded. The gospel goes to the nations now, the rest of the nations. And Israel is blinded in part uh, until the fullness of the nations comes in. And when, and, and again, what does the promise have to do with? It's all the nations being blessed in Christ. Israel is going to see those promises being fulfilled and it's also going to include them they're going to be included in that they're one of the nations in whom or who are going to be blessed in christ i have so no I problem with what you said so far is okay. israel is israel the israel that you just said is that defined as those people who live in this the, that land about the side of size of rhode island in it, the middle east or is it? yes it's defined as Jews. <laughs> 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 Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to like, is it the scattered Israel or is it the Israel that lives in the land? Like, what's defining that Israel that sees the nations get saved? That they're Jews. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into like this huge debacle about. This is why I mentioned like Kazor theory earlier. Like, that's oh no, like, I'm still not even thinking. I'm still not even worried about yeah, that. Well, I'm not gonna get into like the huge debacle about. No, you know, no, no. Like a, I think Jew. No, I'm just thinking like, all right, so if if Israel, if the way you describe Israel is going to see the nations get saved, um, are, is that Israel, like is Israel looking out from the, from the land of Israel and, oh, the nations are all saved, or is it scattered Israel or just, you know, ethnic Israel? I can't Israel. tell you how exactly all that's going to play out. I think the prophecy is for us to see, to look back on and, and look at how it was fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So I can't, I can't like draw out like a sketch of, you know, what that's going to look like in the future. But well, I know that, I have two Jewish friends, they're Christians. And uh, cool. the way they describe it is that, you know, Jews have to be saved just like everyone else. That's, that's their take. But my question is, uh, are you familiar with uh, Michael Brown and where do your views sort of verge against him or are, because he believes that, you know, all of national Israel will, will be saved and they'll be blessed. Um, kind of like what you're saying. I don't know a whole lot about his eschatology. I've heard that he has some dispensational. Oh yeah. He's a big dispensationalist for sure. Okay. Yeah. So I would disagree with him in that I, I'm not a dispensationalist, but. Um, I don't think there's like this difference between, uh, you know, uh, the Israel of God, as Paul would put it, right? Like the true Israel and the church. I think that the discussion in Romans 9 through 11 is uh, the Israel of God, but it's also, I think Israel, it's also his fellow kinsmen. So I just think that both parties are in view there in, in, in that particular uh, section of scripture. Um, so I mean I would I I yeah I would disagree with Michael Brown and that I I reject his everything that comes along with dispensationalism. I mean that's like the only point right. that we would have in common. What do you make of the verse? And I'm just paraphrasing here because it's not in front of me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it's I think it's in Romans nine. Um, the natural seed. These are not the children of God. What what is he? I think it goes back to the same um, point 
that I've uh, that I made earlier and that we agreed upon that uh, you're begotten of God through faith in Christ. Okay. You know, being being a, a natural descendant of Abraham does not uh, automatically make you righteous before God. In fact. Paul says explicitly that they're worse off because natural descendants of Abraham were given the law and they dishonored God by breaking it. So they're not better off for being just by being natural descendants of Abraham. I think that that's what Paul's point is there when he says that these are not the sons of God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very interesting how John the Baptist comes on the scene and uh, way before Paul. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Says, yeah. don't think to say to yourselves, Abraham is our father. Oh, man. Yeah. But he makes a profound that? statement, actually. He says God can raise up descendants of Abraham from these stones. Well, there you go. I mean, that's that's Tyler, that's don't that's you that's see? That, that. <laughs> this is kind of, this is kind of uh, uh, off topic a little bit, but I've had that, that, that scripture in my mind for like the last couple of weeks now. Which because one? It's the the part where he says God can raise up right. descendants of Abraham from rocks, <laughs> right? That 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 really tripped me out because it, it's not it's not like I said this is kind of off topic, but I was thinking about that and I was thinking, man, you know, like it, it reminded me just of like like how we approach uh, certain you know debates or doctrines or whatever in like the role that the balance that has to be struck between like logic and logical arguments and stuff like that in scripture because i was like man that's that's so crazy like if i didn't have uh an all-knowing god to tell me that that's possible i would say that that's nonsense <laughs> you know right but there you but go I mean, is saying that god can actually create a descendant of abraham from rocks like that's yeah but I, but Tie that one together yeah. with Paul saying that the Jew is one who's circumcised of the heart. It's the same thing. Um, it's, yeah, man, I, I, it's I, a don't spiritual, the, I don't know. So in other words, a Gentile not being of the physical line of Abraham can yeah, be circumcised of and be a child of the promise, just like he could raise up a rock to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where the disconnect is here. Well, because it it strongly implies that there's no reason for ethnicity to have anything any uh you know v variable in it. It's not it, it's not even really placing like a whole lot of um importance on ethnicity. I mean, I think that my illustration that I've given three or four times now kind of shows why that is. I mean, well, if it's not ethnicity, what I don't I don't understand your point. Then honestly, if, if it's, well, no, it's not like I'm emphasizing the ethnic. Well, okay, I don't want to misspeak now because I don't want to like confuse you further. But um, <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> I am too. No. Okay, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm just doing a bad job. I'm sorry. So you know, you were talking about uh, Paul saying, you know, after the fullness of the Gentiles, you know, all Israel will be saved. And so when we're like thinking of that in our heads, it's like, okay, well, you are thinking that it's all ethnic Israel will be saved or blessed. And so I mean, I don't know where the disconnect is of when we talk about Israel. Who are you referring to Israel versus, you know, what we were thinking of as ethnic Israel? Hello? I think Tyler lost a connection. I don't hear anything. <clears throat> oh yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. He got booted. I think we were all on the same page when when he was referring to Israel. We were all thinking it was ethnic Israel. Hey. Right. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Off again. 
what I meant what I meant by that is that when I'm thinking about it, I'm not even thinking so much about that part. I'm thinking about just what I see Paul saying in that section. That he's he's saying that he's answering the question, why are your fellow Jews not getting saved? He makes the point that it was to them that all the covenants, the law, the the, the service and worship of God, all of these things of promises were all made. And and they're the ones who even produced the Messiah. Because the Messiah came out of the nation of Israel. And then he talks about the fact that they've been blinded, that the Gentiles are now being saved, but they're going to see the fulfillment of those promises that were initially made to them, and they're going to be the recipients of it as well, along with the rest of the, the nations. That's all I'm saying. So I, I don't know how else I agree. to explain it. Okay, I, I agree with that. Well, see, I feel like I've explained it five times, and you keep saying you agree, and then we keep going back to me. Well, no, <laughs> what you just said, I can completely agree with, but then you yeah, said yeah. something else about, well, there will be some, like, additional blessing. And I didn't say anything about the additional blessing. I said that they're going to receive... You, you asked me a question about um, if that includes, like, the, the nations, like, giving their money to Israel or something like that, and I said, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Right, because I was trying to hone in what that blessing would look like, and you said you couldn't really articulate, but that there would be basically well, a I, blessing that they would have versus, you know, a regular Christian. Yeah, I reformed my answer a bit, though. I said okay. that it has to be with the nations being blessed in Christ. So that was that, that was initially given to them as a nation, and now they're, they're going to see it fulfilled, and they're going to be the recipients of it as well. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think that's that's the point Paul's making there. Right? I think I mean I'm, I don't know how else I could like simplify it. That's as simple as it can get in my mind. So. So Lori, what do you think? Huh? <laughs> you gotta go uh, put put some ice on her head after listening to that discussion. <laughs> I don't think. Uh... I, I don't know. Like I know when I, this is the truth. When I first came out of dispensationalism, I felt like a traitor. <laughs> I, I did. Um, uh, in this, it, it, about Israel. Like I was like, Lord, I don't want to be the, you know, the, uh, what do you call it? The apostate, the, uh, yeah, the one right. that, you know, in my, Huh? Anti Semite. Oh, absolutely, right. And um I mean I've talked with a friend of mine like about this and she is adamant that uh Christ is coming back for him. Uh -huh. So he already came. I'm a heretic. <laughs> But I used to feel lots of, uh, I don't know if it was guilt or almost like a fear that, because she actually quoted that scripture, those who bless you will, I will bless those who curse you, I will curse Yeah. But wasn't that to Abraham? Yes. Yeah, to Abraham. Yeah. But that's that's the scripture that's quoted all the time, right? Keep people in check. You know, it's it's hard with those Old Testament prophecies because you go back in there and like if you didn't have the New Testament written and you went to all the Old Testament promises and you gathered them together, you would come to the conclusion that God is gonna, you know, save Israel, gonna gather them. But <laughs> there's, there's a lot of scriptures that in the Old Testament that don't imply that whatsoever. You know, look at look at the reiteration of uh, Isaiah five in the divorce uh, decree in in the Gospels. I mean, the Jesus did Jesus spoke no, nothing but condemnation when he was on this earth, <sighs> followed by jo what John the Baptist said. You know, th that you know, hey, you think you're Abraham's children? That that ain't gonna get you nowhere. You know, so. 
it's easy to take those Old Testament promises at face value and then kind of transfer them over. But like, look at, you know, and, and Tyler, I know I've brought this up before and, and, um, and, and you, and you kind of agreed with me a little bit. Like if you take the Old Testament prophecy in Hosea about the gathering of the 10 Northern tribes, which you would think that's what it was about in Hosea 2, where he makes a covenant with them in the wilderness. And then Peter gets the vision and it's the same beasts, fowls and creeping things that are in Hosea 2. And Peter interprets the, the, the vision as, well, God, you know, accepts people from every nation, tongue and tribe. And then he goes and talks to Gentiles like Cornelius. Cornelius. So you see these, you see these Old Testament promise type uh, scriptures and uh, you know prophecies being quoted by New Testament writers as if they're being fulfilled right then and there, and that's what convinced me. That's actually what got me out of dispensationalism. So I know it's easy to look at those prophecies and say, "Well, God promised this and you know and that to to Israel," but the the thing that's tricky about Tyler's argument is that it's different from the dispensationalist argument. The dispensationalist would say, like Michael Brown would say, hey, God promised Israel the land and he's gonna fulfill that. Tyler's not saying that at all. Tyler's saying God promised to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and that's the promise that still needs to get fulfilled and Israel is gonna see that happen. I'm still disconnected with, or I don't understand how Israel seeing the nations getting saved is their promise being fulfilled. That makes no sense to me. Like, how does that help Israel just seeing the so Israel? Well, no, I'm not saying like I'm not saying they're gonna get like they're gonna see all these Gentiles worshiping God and then they're going to say, hey, let's become Christian or something like that. That's not how I meant to make right. it sound. I don't know, like, the order of how everything's going to happen. I'm just, I, I was right. saying that, just, yeah, but, but both of those things are true. They're not only going to see those promises from the past, but they're going to be the recipients of it, just like all the other nations are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. I see all of the prophecies, you know, culminating in Christ and not only fulfilling it, but literally changing it. You know, like you have, you have changes. It's kind of like Jesus comes along. Like we talked about the kingdom before, you know, Jesus, they expect a certain thing with the kingdom to them. And even the, even the apostles who spent three years with Christ intimately right before his ascension say, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he doesn't really answer them because he can't answer them. He doesn't want to tell them at this point. No, guess what? The kingdom is not going to be restored to Israel because Paul tells you why it was a mystery that wasn't revealed until God gave it to Paul. Where that, and, and, and the, it's not that Paul got the mystery that, hey, Paul, the kingdom's not going to get restored. No, he got it not in the negative, but he got it in the positive. And the positive was, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. He got in the positive in that the promises are now fulfilled. It's in the positive in that Jew and Gentile are one new man in Christ. The middle wall of partition has been torn down and there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the Jew and the Gentile. That's how he got the mystery. But Jesus held the mystery and didn't want to tell these disciples at the time that their nation was going to be destroyed for good uh that he said you i got things to tell you that you can't bear and that was it they couldn't bear that at the time but when the comforter was to come he would guide them into all truth how because the, of the gloriousness of the entire world now getting saved in the new covenant you know it was promised in jeremiah 31 31 to judah and israel and it was only promised to them and that's the part of the mystery. But, but you know, wait, um, because I, I do see, you know, what you're saying about that this was a mystery. But every time you say that in the back of my mind, it goes, well, this is the song of Moses. 
in Deuteronomy 32. Exactly. Right. I will call another pe- a foolish people and I will provoke you to jealousy. And so, I mean, that's, I mean, that's exactly what Paul is saying. He's just sort of reiterating the song of Moses there. So, I, I mean, I don't really see how that really was a mystery. Well, well, a mystery could just entail that it wasn't fully understood. It doesn't necessarily mean that, like, it wasn't stated yet or it wasn't talked about yet. It could just mean that they didn't fully understand it yet. It wasn't right. It's there. It was they didn't understand how it would play out. Okay, the method was a mystery, not yeah. not the, the and, concept. And, okay. and Stacy, think about the, the parables again. So how does Jesus continue this mystery? He foretells it in the parables and he makes this change like the steward who loses his stewardship Mm -hmm. which is israel he's got the prodigal son who you know is is uh is lost and found like the like the 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 coin and the sheep um you talked about the the song of moses in the song of moses they were going to become uh angry and jealous by a foolish nation well that's the parable of the prodigal son Right. So, I mean, I, I completely understand now if we say that when Paul was describing the mystery, it was the method of how it would play out. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. a good way to describe it. All right. You know, but what happens to the, if you follow, those five parables are to me, I know I talk about them all the time because they really are incredibly telling. They really are. If, if you don't pay attention to those five parables that Jesus tells in a row on purpose, then you miss a lot because, you know, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the, um, the, it goes right into the, you know, the older son who refuses to rejoice when the younger one is, was lost and then found, just like the, just like the coin and, and the sheep. But then it doesn't stop there. See, if the parable stopped there, then, then the picture Jesus was trying to portray would be that Israel just refuses to get, to get happy when Gentiles get saved. No, that's not it at all. He goes into the next parable, and the steward, who's about to lose his stewardship, literally loses his stewardship. And what does he have to do? He's got to make friends with the unrighteous mammon. What does that mean? That means that he's got to get saved like the Gentiles do, but then it doesn't even stop there. Now you go into Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus represents Gentiles. Rich man represents Jews. And what happens to the rich man? He's shut out. He cannot get out. He's done. And, and, you know, you know this is about Israel because of the last line in, in the parable. They won't believe even if someone were to rise from the dead. I mean, Jesus is like, in my mind, he's saying it quite plainly. Israel is the sacrifice. It talks about the sacrifice in Basra, you know, in in Isaiah. Just like Jesus was sacrificed for the world, Israel was sacrificed for the world. That's how I'm looking at this whole thing. Jesus actually becomes Israel. He goes through the same footsteps we talked about the other night. He, gets, he comes out of Egypt, he gets baptized, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days, you know, and then he goes up to the mount, just like they went up to the mount to receive the law, Jesus goes up to the mount and gives a sermon on the mount. The whole thing is a parallel. He's Israel, but he's the Israel that can follow the law. And then we become the seed through him. That's the only seed that there is, as far as I can tell, you know, I it's it's a spiritual seed but anyway um it's a, it, it's a it's it's a big story that seems to say to me that the, the uh, a nation um a group of ethnic people is not important anymore in fact there was no such thing it's not like god had a bunch of nations and then picked the nation no, he picked Abraham, and Abraham, there was no such thing as Jew and Gentile. So Abraham gives birth, you know, to Isaac. Isaac gives birth to Jacob. Jacob's name is changed, and there you have Israel. But what is Israel? 
it's no different. Their DNA is ultimately no different than anyone else. You know, and the promise of the old covenant is simply just a part of the shadow. And we all agree on that. And the, but the Abrahamic covenant, I believe, was fulfilled in, in Christ. The sign was given to Abraham of circumcision. And then, the, you know, ultimately meaning that the flesh would be cut off and, and, and the spirit, you know, to make way for the spirit. That's what all, all is written in John. Like, you know, it's all flesh to spirit. Nicodemus, flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to spirit. The woman at the well that we talked about before. You know, you're not going to worship on this mountain uh, where they worship on Gerizim or nor Mount Moriah like the Jews do, but it's going to be everywhere, you know, in, in spirit and in truth. So to me, the whole, the whole theme of the Bible is that ethnicity doesn't matter. Cool. Man. I'm getting tired. That's because it's midnight where we're at. <laughs> it's the witching hour there. Yep. <clears throat> Lori, do you have daylight savings time? Mm hmm. So, what time is it for you now? Nine. So, it follows hours? Like when we, when we yep. go back, you go back too? Yeah. Apparently, though, apparently we're not going to have it next year. Really? Yeah. What changed? I don't know. Yeah, but you know what? They have to decide, and then they talk about it for another 20 years. And so we'll see. I'll believe it when I see it. Well, it's stupid in my opinion. Yeah, it really is. It just throws everybody off. Yeah. Anybody know why they started that? I, I thought it was to save energy. To throw off the flat earthers. <laughs> 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 That's just my opinion. <laughs> um, Conspiracy. I think it had something to do with farmers. The only, that's, that's the line they fed us anyway. I don't see how it could, but whatever. The only thing flat earthers have to fear is sphere itself. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it changes next year. Guess we'll find out. I wish we'd we change too. You wish it would? Mm hmm. Well, yeah, I. I'd rather just keep the same time. Oh, me too. Me too. If, you know what? The older you get, the more screwed up your sleep gets and. That's right. Everything. You wouldn't think it would, but. Man, can this guy draw? Oh. Who's that? I follow this guy on YouTube. I've been learning how to sketch. Which oh, I, is that what you're... can you hear it? Yeah, I was wondering what that noise was. I didn't. I thought you were like following your nails or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm. I've been sketching, listening. Oh. Um, yeah. yeah it's so. Amazing. It's amazing how well people, some people can do oh, some things. It's just, there's so, some people are just so talented. I was watching a pianist and Stacy would appreciate this since he's a pianist. Stacy, have you ever heard of Yuja Wang? I think I, I've heard of a Wang, but I, I'm not sure. You have got to see this girl play the piano. It is I mean, it is utterly insane. <laughs> she is, I mean, you watch her play the classical stuff and some of it's really, really, um, really, really difficult, extremely difficult to play. Mm -hmm. But I just watched her play something. Um, 
let me because uh, I want I definitely want you to see this. I'm gonna I'm gonna find out what it was, and you could uh, either look it up. It was. And it's it's UJ Y U J A Wang. And if you really want to see just how incredibly talented she is, watch her play Flight of the Bumblebee. It's very quick. It's almost like a show off piece. It's not something that you'd want to, you know, put in your car as you drive around, but you can't your eyes can't even follow her fingers they're so fast yeah um my overall impression when i hear and i'm only speaking in general terms because there is an oriental pianist that does really play with a great deal of emotion but from all of the samples that i've heard of oriental pianist it's it's very mechanical um it's they sort of promote or encourage technique no and, heart right exactly well she will play the you know well there's a reason for that too because in oriental um culture it's sort of taboo for you to show your emotion yeah but i don't know i mean there's another girl yodam sun who i like she's korean lots of emotion while she plays and Yuja will show emotion if she's sure. doing a, a, a certain piece. Yo-Yo Ma also, you know, shows emotion. So it's not like I'm speaking in complete, you know, everyone. Right. But, general, uh, yeah. But in the general uh, sample, uh, it is like really no heart. But there are exceptions, of course. But whether there's heart or not, um, this song, I mean, this little, like I said, I think it's only like two or three minutes. You really, it's really jaw dropping. Well, that, the reason why is because she has a Chinese tiger mom. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> and they have to practice 14 hours a day, you know? That's, yeah, that's true. No, it is Not, true. They weren't born a prodigy. There's, there's someone that um, said, you know, it really has nothing to do with talent. <laughs> So even, you know, drawing and stuff, it's just whatever you put 10,000 hours into, you're going to get good. I don't know. You know what? There's some people out there, Stacy, that are just born to do it. Like I have an uncle. The combination. That right? could hear one song and he could play anything. And I mean with heart. He didn't have to read the music, didn't have to do anything. Some people just have that much talent. Other people have to work hard. How did that saying go? If talent don't work hard, hard work beats talent. Something like that. Yeah, there's some people who are gonna do certain things and just only reach a certain, you know, yeah. limit. And then yeah. other people will just will just soar with it. Yeah. I was always sorry I never did music. My whole family was very musical. It's not too late to learn. I taught my mother how to play the Irish whistle at 75. <laughs> my son bought a piano. And uh, I don't know. The piano is actually one of the easiest instruments to play and one of the hardest instruments to master. Yeah. I agree with that. I played the guitar for so many years and uh, it is a difficult instrument, especially when you have big hands and big fingers. It's just, it's very, you know, con you, you really have to contort your finger to, to play certain oh, things. Yeah. I had a friend of mine who um, I used to play music with when I was younger, and he had like chubby fingers, and it was so frustrating to me watching him play. <laughs> yeah. well, if you, if you play, if you play with a Sorry. classical guitar, the strings are spread out a little bit more. Right. Yeah. Nylon, nylon string. Mm-hmm. 
And um, I was also, I also had the same thing with, um, there was a family friend of ours that I was uh, actually teaching for a, a while. And um, he, uh, he had like, yeah, he had like super fat fingers, man. You can tell like the difference between someone that has like skinny fingers, you know, and someone that has like fat fingers trying to play the guitar. I mean, they could do it, you know, but you can just tell like they have to work a lot harder at it sometimes. But. <clears throat> Like, I, I would think bass might be probably an easier instrument if you got five fingers. It's, it's kind of the same with uh, people who have little hands trying to play the piano. You know, they can't do that tenth interval. They have to really, really work hard at it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can, yeah, I definitely think like having like longer fingers and stuff would have, uh, would be more of an advantage if you're going to be, a, if you're going to play the piano. <clears throat> Well, you guys, I think I'm going to have to say goodnight. Yeah, cool. yeah. yeah I'm, I'm really going. What's that? Uh, I was just saying I'm going to get going, too. Actually, I'm kind of tired. But that was a good time. Yeah. 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 Okay, we'll see you guys again. All right. See you yeah. later. God bless. God bless. Good night. Good night. Good night.